Okay, so day ticket fishing, it's something we all do, we all love it at times, we all hate it at times, and it's very easy to get it wrong a lot of the time. So we're gonna go over 10 tips uh, of what I've discovered over the last 30 years of fishing day tickets. Uh, what I've done wrong, what I've done right, what I would do again if I went back to that venue, and hopefully it'll pass on a lot of valuable information to you, the viewer, that are going to all these open access venues like the day tickets all over the country, which let's be honest, we're still during furlough, they're all rammed, so hopefully it's gonna put you some more fish on the bank, some valuable information. So the first one we're gonna look at, and it's obvious, is location. Uh, and it goes without saying, and everybody always says it, that you've got to be on them to catch them, which is kind of a, it's a rhetorical comment really, isn't it? Because it goes without saying that if you haven't got any fish in front of you, you aren't gonna catch them. Um, so how do you go about maximising that chance? Well, take, for example, Linear. Massive complex, but easily the busiest complex in the country. There's eight, 10 lakes, whatever it is. And what a lot of people do is they look at the website, they go, right, uh, I'm going on St. John's, or I'm going on Manor. And if they, and they turn up, and if they don't get on them, you're, all, you're defeated straight away because you can't get on that lake. Um, so keep an open mind. Say, right, I'm gonna to go to Linear, I'm gonna to go to Bluebell, there's loads of lakes. And if as long as I can find some fish and find a swim, I'm quite happy to fish on any lakes. Let's be honest, at Linear, the biggest fish, there's a lot of big 40 pounders in all the lakes now, so you aren't specifically targeting one fish in one lake. It's not that sort of complex on a day ticket. It's not like a campaign on a syndicate. So what do I do when I get there? Well, invariably, you know, me and Moz, I've done a lot of fishing together on day tickets for the Open Access Series. So. I think with time served and also obviously the fishing we've both done on the venues around the country before the open access shoot. So um, I think what I try to do is we always fish midweek, me and Moz. So if we do a shoot or if I go fishing, I fish midweek. Technically, the lake should be quieter. It isn't the case anymore because everywhere is rammed uh, because of the virus. But normally, you know, you used to turn up at Linear when there was three lakes and there'd be, there'd be kind of like, you know, five angles on each lake on a Sunday night. That's not the case anymore. So. What makes carp fishing harder these days is the more people that are doing it, which means more lines in the water, which means more pressure. Now, even say for example, on St. John's, I've done it before years ago where there was one fish, uh, one swim free in the shallows. I've got a couple of rods, I've gone down, plop, plop, couple of solid bags, and I've had like three or four bites in two hours. Back to my swim, happy as Larry. And that was one swim on a very, very busy lake with no lines in, and you wouldn't think that that would matter. But that, for me, is something to look at. You know, obviously everybody knows about being on the end of a wind or if the wind is stale, being on the back of it, you know. But a lot of this will be dictated to by the amount of anglers that are on the lake. So what I would suggest is try and pick a lake that's not so busy. Always keep your eyes up. Don't sit in your baby plane on your phone or on your iPad. Watch that water like a hawk. And believe me, I mean, I fished at Merrington and, and it was cold, it was early spring. We hadn't put a lot of bait out, so I hadn't committed to an area. Saw fish showing on the opposite side, on an end of a southwesterly. Two rods, went round, had a bite within half an hour. And literally, I was walking back round past an angler that said to me, I was going to do that. Well, you were going to do it, but we did it and we caught one. Which kind of, the effort equals reward. Don't get me wrong, I've done it loads of times where you move on to fish, they're fizzing, they're ripping it up. You're almost thinking, right, well, I'll put my unuki mat there and that's why I have the pictures. You don't catch anything. You know, at the end of the day, they're wild animals. but. It's the effort entailing that that makes the result more worthy at the end of it. Because I guarantee you, you'll get more satisfaction out of catching a fish because you've done something rather than just sitting in a swim and hoping that in your three or four nights fishing that the fish are going to come across you. You know, you've almost got to make it happen on these day ticket lakes now because the technology in fishing has moved on so much and all the edges are out there now that most anglers now are operating at 80 to 90% capacity. The 100 percenters, you know, your Dave Lanes, your Daryl Pecks, they are the 100 percent boys now. And believe me, you've got to try exceptionally hard to stay at the top of your tree now because everybody has, has got so much, so much knowledge within their armour, if you like. So location is prime. If you're not on them, you can't catch them. If there's an empty swim and there's a couple, you see one show, because if you see one show, there's more fish there, I guarantee it. Make that effort get into a swim, I can't begin to tell you, certainly on filming projects, and, and it shouldn't be like this, but when I'm filming, I try harder because you want to produce for the cameras, if you like. And, and so it's always like the effort is, is worth the reward, or even if you don't catch anything, it's worth the move, and you know it just refreshes you. So 
try and get on them at all costs. Um, you know, and, and just drop a couple of little rigs. Don't go in with, if they're showing 20 yards out, don't go in with five ounce ledge. You know, just a little couple of one ounce bombs in a little bag. It's enough for a bite. It's enough for a big fish. So location, location, location is prime. So next up we're going to look at baiting and more specifically when I say baiting I'm, it's more it's almost like a, a seasonal kind of tip this so say for example you're coming into early spring so March time most anglers start thinking about getting the rods out after the winter they pile onto the lakes all the day ticket lakes and of course there's just spawns going everywhere and what you're actually probably doing is you're ruining it before you even cast out um, I'm really really cautious and years and years ago I always used to use a 6 and 12 principle so I'd I'd, bait, I'd fish all three rods on a spot and I'd put 12 spots out. That was back in the day when we used an old spot where most of the mixture should fly out the back end. But, so I put 12 out, if I got a bite, I'd refresh with six. Uh, but that is only applicable on conditions. So you've got to kind of use a bit of your watercraft and gauge. So if you turn up in March and it might be 15 degrees in the day, you think, God, oh, it's lovely. But then it's dropping to sort of one and zero degrees at night, that is a massive temperature crash. And it's just gonna knock the fish. What the fish don't like is they don't like up and down with the weather, they like consistent. So if it's consistently cool, they'll adjust to that and feed accordingly. If it's obviously consistently warm, the temperature is gonna warm more, which probably will indicate the fish will be more active. So you can tell that you're gonna to have to put more bait in. But I see it time and time and again, where people either just, they go in all guns blazing, fishing for a big hit, instead of fishing for one fish at a time. Look at a good match angler. They don't, they might use a couple of gallon of maggots in a match, but they don't just pour them all out in and scoop things that they use on the end of a pole, do they? They're just littling off and littling off with the pole, bit in the scoop. They can build the swim, and that's what you're trying to do with carp fishing. You can learn a lot from match anglers and try to emulate how they understand what they're feeding. They'll feed a short line, you know, they'll feed another little spot. They're giving themselves options, but try not to sort of put too much in from the off you know if you're fishing in low pressure great it's probably going to dictate that you can get away with putting a bit more bait in because the fish are going to respond to it if it's sky high pressure 1030 and you're getting cooler temperatures at night the sod's law is they're probably going to be off the bottom at some distance you know so zigs would be my primarily attack certainly early spring zigs work well issue is a lot of day ticket lakes are now banning zigs because of the foul looking the well stocked lakes the small commercials where there's an abundance of fish that are moving around in packs you do stand a chance of foul looking but you know just look at the rules of the fishery before you go so try not to be overgunned with the bait i've done it myself loads of times i still do it from time to time when i'm fishing from a boat in france and what i've decided to do now is when i go out in a boat i only take out enough bait that i want to put on that spot and then i can't be tempted to just sling another couple of kilo over the side of the boat and it's the same with your fishing when you're fishing from a bank or you're spotting and right, I'm going to put 10 spots out until I get a buy. I'm not going to put anything else out there. If you think you're getting turned over, you know, if you're using oily hemp and stuff like that, that gives off an, a visual aid that you can see the slick out in the pond, something is grubbing around there. So you might just want to refresh it with a couple of spots. We've done that lots of times and lots of filming projects over the years. Other people that I've filmed with, they're very, very good at reading the water and just a couple of spots on top of it. People like Bartlett and Tommy Maker, they're just masters at this and knowing just when to put a couple of spots in because they associate the spot on day tickets as, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, as a dinner bell. And that can just stimulate a bite. And obviously a few particles falling through the column, the fish might be sitting four foot off the bottom and then they follow it down and you sometimes get a bite, you know. So go easy on the bait and probably law of averages says that at the end of your session, you'll probably racked up a few more fish than if you'd have gone in guns blazing and spotted out 30 kilo. So to really confuse matters, whilst we've spoke about little and often and holding back on the bait, there are two particular instances where I'm not afraid to, to go for it with the bait. Obviously, you've got to look at the weather conditions. If it's high pressure and it's, it's, you know, it's really, really high pressure and you think, well, they're not going to be on the bottom, then don't put loads of bait in. But I'll, I'll sort of look back at lakes like Trent View, where you're not fishing far out. I think 10, 11 wraps is the bottom of the shelf. 
but it's 17, 18 foot deep. Places like St. John's and Brazenose are up to 16, 17 foot deep in the middle. I think deeper lakes, you can get away with, when you've had a bar, you know, if you tram line, if you've got all three on one spot and you have a bar, you might have a double take and you can get away with topping up over the top of them, if that makes sense, and recasting because of the depth. I think the depth masks the sound of the lead going in because don't underestimate how far that noise travels when a lead goes in. And certainly on shallow lakes, I'm sort of really hesitant. Even if I'm tramming on, on a shallow lake with three rods, if I get a bite on one rod, I'm almost tempted. If it's bite time in the morning, which is another instance you should be looking at, don't worth, don't recast with that one rod. If you've got three on one spot, you've still got two rods on that spot. You know fish are visiting the spot because you've just had a bite. So if it's shallow, I would ease back and leave it until bite time has gone, then put more bait in and then have a recast. But on deeper lakes, you can get away with it. Certainly on weedier lakes, take Stanick lakes, for example, not particularly deep, nine, 10 foot, but during cart wars filming, I found this particular spot from one bank and it was bang in the middle of the lake, basically. Not a massive lake, Stanick at all. Uh, I think it was Mallard that uh, I fished for cart wars. So I went back to film uh, a shoot there, for a day ticket shoot. And I was so obsessed about fishing that one spot because it had been so productive for good fish as well. It was basically a spot probably the size of a bivy, big enough for, for three rods quite comfortably, but surrounded by thick walls of heavy Canadian. So what that meant was if I got a bite, then I could, I could get away with spotting on top because all the fish do is they tend to drift over the top of the weed, they'll drop down. So they're always in and out the weed and they'll use the weed, not only for warmth, but as cover. So if they feel a bit on edge or they know they're being fished for, they'll just hold back and they'll, they'll, they'll use the sanctuary of the weed as a blanket, if you like. So in a weedy example, you can get away with baiting on top of them or in a deeper lake is another example. Certainly lakes like Trent View, St. John's, Brazenose, areas of B2, the Manor. You know, I'm cross-referencing all these busy day ticket lakes that you, the viewer, is likely to have fished or is going to fish in the future. Mallard at Bluebell, they're quite deep lakes. So again, you can get away with, with spawning on top of them. And again, in heavy weed, the fish use the weed as a cover, get away with murder. So it wouldn't be a tip section if we didn't cover floater fishing. As you can tell, I'm, I'm dying to laugh because he's smirking behind the camera, knowing full well that I could probably do a half an hour on surface fishing on how bad I am at it. But I think that's a valid point that um, needs addressing, that it's not that I'm rubbish at it. I do everything right um, and I get them feeding, but I somehow manage to just, what I tend to do, and this is well worth listening to, is I feed too many spots. So I'll have the spot mixers out, uh, you know, it'll be stem pallets, they're, they're, they're perfect for, for surface, the floaters that we do. Um, they're very oily, so they give off a slick, but I tend to I bait, I bait too many spots, so consequently you're giving the fish too many options where they move in, they might have a few off one little patch, then they move. So consequently, all I'm doing is reeling in and chasing them, and that obviously puts them on edge. Um, and I'm not very good at it. I can catch carp off the top, but I like having a go because there's nothing more kind of exciting and exhilarating as watching them. You know, it's like walking down the canal and seeing a guy float fishing. You watch his float because it's something to, to look at. You know, when you're sitting behind buzzers all the time, it can get a bit droning where you're not really looking at anything in particular, just the water. But there was loads of instances, not just on filming projects, where I'll have a go, knowing full well that I'm likely to mess it up, but I do catch a few. And the times where I've been out on shoots for the open access, places like the Q Lake, Stanick, where it's got as bonus fish. So have a go, explore these little swims. Because I mean, I've got me, I always carry my surface fishing gear in the van. It's a little bag, so I can just run back, grab the mixers, grab the bucket, uh, the book, the bag of stuff with all my, like, my hook links, my scales, things like that. And you can just go off having a great deal of fun for a couple of hours. And it's that adage again about effort equals reward. You might not be very good at it, like I'm not very good at it, but unless we learn, and you, the more you do it, the better you pick tips up and you can look at people like Ian Poole, John Finch, you know, really good surface anglers and just sort of glue them for information. And it, and it, it just make it just make practice makes perfect with surface fishing, absolutely. But it's a deadly tactic and one that is massively, massively underused. <laughs> So local knowledge, and by that I mean always listen to people that know these sort of venues better than you or I do. So 
obviously research, go online, look at websites, but if you're gonna go, I don't know, in a couple of days time, fine. Don't be looking like weeks and weeks in advance because these lakes change so much from on a day-to-day -day basis from not just angling pressure, but weather conditions. But the best person to speak to is when you get to that lake is speak to the on-site bailiff. He is there every single day, barring weekends, I guess. Um, and he knows that lake, he knows what's coming out, he knows what angles are doing, he knows where they're fishing, he might know some hot spots. But listen to what they're saying. And what I tend to do is certainly when I'm going out filming on a venue that I've never been before, which is primarily where we go when we shoot day ticket features, is I'll do a bit of digging beforehand. I don't ask specific questions about spots because normally, as long as I can get myself on fish, I'll find my own spots. But listen to what they say. And what we tend to do is if that sort of scenario hasn't played out for us for 12 hours. So if I get there, I do a night, in the morning, I've caught nothing. I'll then reevaluate because whatever I've listened to from the experts or from the bailiff or the on-site, um, the guys that are sort of running the fishery, hasn't worked for me. So then the clock is ticking and I want to get a result. So take, for example, again, the Q Lake, we went up in Yorkshire. We did what we were told to do by the bailiff. We lost the fish. We had one off the surface, but then the wind picked up and blew down into where the lake funnels uh, into the bottom end where you come over the bridge. And the fish were really, really close in. And obviously there was a lot of like Norfolk reeds, thick Norfolk reeds opposite. That is the obvious spot to put a bait. But that again, that is probably what everybody does. And we were literally, I walked one down, plopped it on a really rock hard spot. That went within 10 minutes. And then I was literally underarming them, probably six foot, eight foot out, right at the bottom of that shelf. And I bet nobody has ever put a bait there before. And it was quite weedy but the spots I was fishing, I was getting mega drops. So something's been in and cleared that, and I bet no one has ever, ever fished there. Right under your tips, right in front of the swim, and we were just getting bites. As the fish were coming through the tunnel, because the lake is connected through a big concrete pipe, they're obviously hugging the margin line and coming right under your tips. Now that is happening on a daily basis when people are fishing on day ticket lakes. So the fish are just coming under your rod tips because nobody is fishing the obvious spot. So you won't even know the fish are there. If they're not showing right on the end of your rod tips, you don't know they're there. It's just trial and error. And because what we were doing wasn't technically working, I thought there's got to be a different way. And once I'd had that one bite out the edge of the left-hand rod, that was telling me that they were just patrolling that margin. And we ended up with, it was utter carnage. I think we had three bites at once on the second morning. So it proved we got it right. And that is very rewarding where you've done something different or you've, you've tried what the experts have said or what the bailiff has said, it hasn't worked for you. Then you thought, right, well, I'll, I'll try something totally different. And then it works. There's no better feeling. It's a bit like when you've moved and you've had a bite when your rods are on the deck. There's no better feeling because what you have done has made a massive difference to what you've caught. Because the chances are, if you'd have sat on them rods fishing the same spots where you've had nothing for 12 hours, you probably would, wouldn't catch. Because normally if a spot is rocking or if the fish are visiting that spot, you'll get a bite pretty quickly, depending on stock levels. So try something different. The rewards are there, honestly. There's so many keys that you can lock to these codes on these day ticket lakes. Things that don't get done, spots that don't get fish. You know, how often do you go to somewhere like St. John's? You go on the point. Oh yeah, well you just fish over the second bar, just into the silt at 80 yards. Everybody does it. The fish are just bound to be on edge. And I always call it, I call it bingo fishing. So almost like you're spinning the roulette wheel and if it's your lucky day, then fish will drop on your spot. So rather than waiting for it to happen, try something different and make it happen. The rewards will be much more beneficial than just sitting behind static rods, like praying that it happens instead of making it happen. <laughs>
and I thought I should be getting a bite. So I reeled the rod in, took the rig off, tied a German, put it on, five minutes, bang, fish. Uh, and that week I had 33 takes and landed 33 fish, all on the Germans, all on wafters. The bottom line was they were feeding hard in the soft stuff. So even a pop-up that's an inch tall will get, was getting missed. I was probably going to run the risk of foul hooking more than catching one. They just wanted to be in the soft stuff. And I think because a lot of today's rigs are media driven, if you like. Uh, now, whilst the spinner rig is a fantastic rig, the companies that blow the rig out of proportion are the companies that invariably want to sell you the products. That's kind of good marketing, I guess. And don't be under no illusions, the QC or the spinner is a fantastic rig, it really is, but it becomes overused. And I think that's it at that position. That's why a few years ago I changed and wanted something different. And I knew no one was really using the German, so I started using it. And what it's proved is whatever lake I've been to, because I've used that rig almost exclusively now for probably four years, um, there is still certain issue instances where I will use a QC rig. There's a certain lake in France that I fish, they're just a sucker for it and it nails them. So for me, the tried and tested theme is that I wouldn't go to that lake and start using a German because I know the QC works so well. So it's about gaining the confidence in one rig and it's the same with upbaits. If you look at all the OAS shoots, primarily it's been German rigs and it's been either PB wafters or it's been milky malt wafters. And we have caught everywhere we've been. I've used that rig in Europe, on loads of different lakes in Europe, that German. Say you might have used a matching S7 match the hatch or a fluoro wafter, but it just keeps working. And it's an element of me fishing that when I get to a lake, I don't worry about rigs. I don't question my rig and I don't question my bait. So all that means is I can clear all that gump out of my mind and just focus on trying to find some fish. Once you've got total confidence in the rig and the bait, everything else becomes immaterial because you're almost expecting to catch. If you could put yourself on fish, you're almost sort of expecting to catch. It's almost like an arrogance, if you like, because you're so confident in what you're doing, you just, you're convinced you're gonna catch. And there's lots and lots of instances where you see a lot of confident anglers and they always catch a lot of fish. Well, they're not cocky, confident, uh, arrogant, if you like. They're just confident in what they do because they, they fish so many different lakes and they use mainly the same rig or the same taxi and it works. So it proves that these fish ain't rocket scientists. You use a good rig with a good bait, a sharp hook and you'll catch. And we've proved that and we'll carry on proving that. You look at people like Dave Lay, for example, uses the same couple of rigs, Ian Chilcott, same, same again. What Ian uses one rig. So that isn't a coincidence. These guys aren't just using this rig because they can't be bothered to learn about other things. They, they use it because it keeps working. You know, and a good rig that, that is working now will still catch a carp in 20 years time. So try and filter away um, some of the gump that is used to try and get you to buy product, if you like. Use something that you think, right, well, I'm fishing a gravel pit where there's lots of weed, but there's also lots of spots. So that obviously a wafter, it lends itself perfectly. Like I'm, where I'm fishing now, it's three foot deep. It's rock hard gravel, you can see the spots. What you don't want on there is a two inch stiff hinge rig or even a QC rig, because I think that will be treated with suspicion. You want something hard on the deck, either a bottom bait or a wafter, something that's gonna grab their attention, but something that is pinned down on the deck. I can't begin to tell you how alien that must look for a chod rig or a stiff hinge rig to be on a three foot clear spot suspended two inches off the bottom. Yes, you may get a bite, but surely that is going to be treated with suspicion. So try and just picture the spot in your own mind. So if you think it's gravel, if you can get away with it, put some hard on the deck. How many people use a double 18 mil bottom bait straight on the bag anymore? Nobody does it, do they? And that's an edge. That in itself is an edge. So confidence is key. Pick a rig that works for you. If you're catching fish on a rig now, don't change it. If you're using a good bait, a good bait will always be a good bait and will always stand the test of time. Next up, we're going to look at spod mixes. And whilst you might think that sounds dull and boring, um, there's certainly a couple of instances I can remember on lakes like Trent View where I've tweaked the mix slightly and it's got quicker and more responsive action from the carp. And again, I think primarily that is down, certainly the Trent View thing is down to the depth. It was 18 foot, you know, it's 18 foot, very, very close in. It's, it's a really deep old pit. And I think the fish just spend so much time off the bottom at a dip, you know, maybe five, six, seven, whatever depth. Uh, and what I found is when we put a load of, uh, I think we're using SLK at Trent View, I mean, we ran out of bait in the end, which was a schoolboy error, 
but when we put more bait through uh, the crusher, so we chopped everything up and used the smaller pallets, uh, the crayfish mini mix, and we used some of uh, the matching, uh, I think it was SLK pallets. I think the fact that those particles were falling through the water slower, it grabbed the fish's attention. So they were definitely, they were just sitting probably four or five foot off the bottom, and then they're folding the bait down, you get bites instantly. It was, it was noticeably more quicker response from the fish when you would put smaller particles out in the mix. Now, obviously at Trent View, for example, it's quite a lot of sort of dead low-lying siltweed at the bottom of the shelf, so you're presenting on top of it. And I think what happens with these particles, whether you're fishing hemp or pallets or chop boilie or crush boilie or crumb, I think that then sort of falls because you get the spread where it falls in a wider spread through deeper water. I think that's just hanging up in all the particles of the weed and I think the fish are just, it turns them on. I think that's the bottom line is they just rip the bottom to shreds just for trying to find every little morsel if you like, but noticeably different. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing more that I like than fishing over boilies with a throwing stick. I don't have to carry a spod rod. I don't carry a marker rod. I'm just carrying boilies, a throwing stick, it's easy. You know, it's very, very low key. It's very minimalistic. So you're not making loads of clattery noise when you're moving on to fish. But I accept that whilst when you're using a longer rig, you're getting these fish picking up one bait, moving, picking up another, they drop the guard a bit easier. Sometimes on certain lakes, there's nothing better than a tight bed of either particles or chop boilers or crush boilers or crumb, a short rig, heavy lead. And it, it just it just nails them every time. So just be mindful. I mean, I love using long rigs, for example, but if I'm fishing over particles or crush boily, I'll shorten the rigs down because the thing with when you're getting fish so focused on one spot, eating small little items, they don't have to move. They can suck and blow and filter everything. So you want a rig that goes in and nails them pretty quick, whereas I think a longer rig can get spat out and get ejected or get missed completely. So refine that spot mix. If you're not getting bites over just straight boily, for example, just try jazzing them all through a crusher. You'll be amazed at the response and it really does get them into a feeding frenzy. We get so many questions, uh, not just as consultants, people like me and Mozza, but even at the day in office, we get that many messages about shelf life versus freezer. Why, where, how, all the things to do with shelf life. And I think a lot of it is a phobia about people's perception that the shelf life bait that manufacturers produce these days is the equivalent to what it was 20 years ago, where it just smelled of soap, it was rock hard, it didn't break down, it was basically like a conker, it was terrible. But those days are gone. Certainly at DNA, the quality of our shelf life is rivaled, is exactly the same as the freezer bait. It is without doubt. It's so soft, it's so pliable. And it was, it was on a journey in France I went to and I'd taken uh, the S7, loads of freezer bait. It was baking hot. So what I was doing, I took some of the liquid food. I'd never been really that into liquids. Uh, but considering that, you know, I am involved with the company, one of the biggest liquid manufacturers in the country, it stood to reason that I was going to start using them. So I started to use this liquid food just primarily as a way to preserve the longevity of the freezer bait because it was so hot. So I was just pouring it in, you can't overdo it. And you, a few hours later, because as the bait is thawing, it just sucks everything in. So I thought, I wonder if it does it the same with shelf life because our shelf life is so soft and pliable. So I started doing it. It doesn't take it on as much because the actual boilie isn't frozen, so it's not absorbing, it's not sucking in as much as it's thawing out. But believe me, even the shelf life of ours, it does take on the liquid foods perfectly. And that's another edge in itself. And, and I think, you know, everybody seems to want everything quicker, faster, more convenient these days. And our shelf life sales, and I'm sure it will be the same for other manufacturers, are absolutely flying. Now I think that's purely down con to convenience and the fact that people have finally realised that shelf life bait is just as good as freezer now. And if that means that if you're going on a week session in France, if there's no facilities, or if you're fishing on a syndicate and there's no freezer, you're there for three or four days in the summer, your bait is going to turn. So why not use shelf life? You know, my van, I carry probably 30, 40 kilo boilies at any one time of, of different flavors throughout the food range you know we do four baits you would do the s7 the switch slk and the nutter s i'd be perfectly happy to grab a bag of freezer shelf life in any any flavor i'm so confident in our range because of the quality and while we're talking about individuality if you like you want to take a look at the eight millers from dna uh, another massive edge you know because there's certainly if you're stalking, for example, what you don't really want in a stalking situation is, is a massive bed of 18 mils. I think they just 
they sort of suss that it's not natural. Whereas a few little eight millers, a bit of hemp, just looks natural. Little rear glowed in, it's perfect. But them eight millers are a massive, massive edge. And obviously you can get them 12 months of the year. You put them in your spod mix, it just looks so, so nice. And for baiting little spots on the edge, they go in like pellets. They're so indiscreet because they're only small, massive, massive edge. And again, it boils down to confidence. Try to eliminate those facts that you're doubting your bait out your mind and you will fish far more efficiently. But certainly little edges like eight millers and self storage, you know, storing the shelf life, it's got to be an advantage, absolutely. <laughs>
try and be different. If everybody around the lake is doing the same thing, try something different. What have you got to lose? Because very often on busy lakes, you'll see like hardly anybody's catching, the odd fish is coming out. Well, that's telling you whatever they're doing isn't working very well because if, say for Brazier is one, for example, might, there might be, I don't know how many carp there's in there, 1,500, a couple thousand. So it's not like it's a low stock gravel pit. So if you're not getting bites, I think there's something more you can be doing. And, and proof of that was Mark Bartlett in the winter series. Uh, and I was just in awe of him. His accuracy, his ability to read the swim, even though the fish weren't showing, he was reading the swim on little slicks that were coming up, little flat spots. He bumped the odd fish when it was on the way down, which was telling him they were just setting him off the bottom. So he refined his mix with the spod syrups. So it was more heavy, so it pulled him down. And he had like, a guy was like, 15 fish the second night, it was incredible. Uh, and that was because he'd done something specific that had made a difference. So Mark's gonna go away learning from that session, not just following somebody in a swim and fishing at 80 yards because that's where the, the angle in the swim before he caught from. So just try and think about things. Don't go in all guns blaze. Another little thing that I do is, I know it shouldn't, if I'm moving on to showing fish, the rods go out first. Normally if I've picked my swim based on what I've seen, I put my bivvy up, I get everything set, and then I'll just sit there, I'll have a cup of tea, and I'm looking where I think I might want to pick my rods. Rather than just rushing, I'll look at the swim and think, right, well, if there's channels in the weed, that's the way they're going to come into the swim, or that's the way they're going to come from that angle. So I'm sort of picturing in my mind the fish's patrol routes without actually seeing them patrolling, if that makes sense. And then you, you put your rigs there accordingly. Uh, and that's what I like to do. I like to almost visualise how I'm going to fish the swim before I even cast out. And it, and it doesn't, doesn't do me too bad over the years so just think outside the box try to be different trust what you do with your rigs and your bait and i'm sure all those months coming and all the planning will come to fruition uh, and you'll succeed in putting more fish on the bank